So tonight is battling bugs, uh, inroads and infectious disease. So if you came here to learn about termites and cockroaches, you might be in the wrong plane. These are little bugs. Uh, these are infectious diseases. We have some great speakers lined up for you today. Our first speaker will be Dr. John Lynch. Uh, Dr. Lynch is an assistant professor in allergy and infectious diseases here at UW Medicine. He's the medical director of the Harborview Infectious Disease Clinic, where he provides specialty care across the spectrum of infectious diseases and also sees patients at the Madison HIV Clinic. He's the medical director of the Harborview Medical Center Employee Health Infectious Disease Center and Antimicrobial Stewardship Program. And he's the assistant medical director at Harborview Medical Center for Infection Control. His clinical interests include trauma-related infections. Harborview has a lot of trauma. Bone and joint infections and tuberculosis. Harborview, believe it or not, still has TB coming in. He provides travel medicine evaluations, vaccinations, and malaria prophylaxis, as well as evaluations of ill returning travelers. And as you probably know, malaria is prevalent in parts of the world. His research focuses on the prevention and treatment of healthcare associated uh, infections. Here he is with his uh, older, older daughter, and he's summiting Mount St. Helens on the right there. His day to day focus includes the prevention of healthcare associated infections the rational use of antimicrobials. What we mean here is you don't want to overuse antibiotics because then you get into trouble if you use them too commonly. Overall employee health at, at Harborview Medical Center. And he also serves as the medical director of the Harborview Infectious Disease Clinic. And he sees patients, as we said, in both that clinic and the Madison HIV Clinic. Dr. Lynch earned his MD from the University of Washington, where he also completed his fellowship in infectious diseases. He did his residency and internship at Mass General in Boston, and he has a master's in public health from the UW School of Public Health. Dr. Lynch, we'll turn things over to you. Welcome. Well, good evening. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me and coming to listen to me talk. I know none of you know me, I hope, because I'm not the type of doctor that you really want to know. Um, but if you did, I'm glad you came anyway. So my job is to sort of set the stage. I've got a couple of cases, some of the background on here for my colleagues to sort of finish off with uh, in the second, or the second third and the third third of the talk today. So let's get rolling here. So let me start right now. When Alexander Fleming accepted the Nobel Prize in 1945, he said right away that the, he had, was deeply concerned about the risk of developing drug-resistant bacteria as a result of the overuse of penicillin. He basically said if people can go out to the store and just buy penicillin, they may not be dosing it correctly, they may be using it for the wrong disease, and as a result get in infections that won't be treated with penicillin anymore. This has sort of, even though it started at the beginning of the quarter of the antibiotic era, this sort of percolated along for decades and decades and actually started to come to the forefront probably in the last 10 to 15 years. And this is a group uh, or a series of little comments the CDC put together in 2008. And this is kind of the context in which I want to sort of set up the rest of the talk. First, I'll tell you this, antibiotics are being misused. About 50% of all antibiotics used in the United States are estimated to be misused, half. Antibiotic misuse adversely impacts both patients and society. Unlike medications used for hypertension or for diabetes, putting aside the economic consequences of using those drugs, if I treat this half of the room with an antibiotic, it has an impact on this half of the room. So when I use an antibiotic in any person, I'm treating everyone to a certain extent. And so when I misuse an antibiotic, I'm misusing it in everyone. On the, conversely, if I improve antibiotic use, I improve patient outcomes. So if I use the right bug for the right person at the right dose, the outcomes are better and it saves money. And as I sort of corollary of that second point, so using antibiotics appropriately is a public health imperative. As an infectious disease doctor, when I treat an individual, I have to think about everyone sitting behind that person as well as the person right in front of me, which is a slightly different perspective than a lot of physicians take or need to take when they're taking care of the person uh, right there. So that's 2008. This is the update from just last year, and you can kind of get a sense of the different tone here. The CDC just published this. You can, uh, it's freely available online. You just Google antibiotic resistance threats. So the CDC's kind of ranked this up, and they've gone through a whole bunch of different organisms. 
and sort of rank them in terms of their threat status. And some of these you've probably heard of. This may be a little bit hard to read, but right in the middle there, actually in the bottom of the serious threat category is methicillin resistant staph aureus, MRSA. How many people have heard of MRSA? Everyone has. That's, an, that's, a, that's in the middle of the serious threat one. MRSA kills about 19,000 people a year in the United States. And not to put down HIV, but more people die of MRSA infections than die of HIV AIDS in the United States. But what I would call your attention to is going up to the urgent threats. Clostridium difficile, how many people have heard of Clostridium difficile? Lots of people, not as many as MRSA. That's an urgent threat, not necessarily a drug resistant threat, but a threat that's a result of inappropriate and sometimes appropriate antibiotic use. That's the number one healthcare associated infection in the United States these days, not MRSA. Clostridium difficile causing colitis and diarrhea as a result of antibiotic use. The next one's called carbapenem resistant enterobacteriaceae. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that. How many people have heard about carbapenem resistant enterobacteriaceae? <laughs> okay. That's the urgent threat, though, right? You've all heard of MRSA down there, but this is the one you're going to be hearing about in the future CREs. And then drug resistant Neisseria gonorrhea. Now, I won't ask anyone. Who's heard of that? Because, you know, but I'm an infectious disease doctor. You've got to talk about gonorrhea. But people may not realize that this is an urgent threat to uh, our society as well. So let's get into a case. This first case is actually a real one. His name's David Ricci. I'll show you his picture in a moment. The story is that uh, not last fall, the fall before, I was called by one of our orthopedic surgeons. I was in my office, and he called me up and said, John, do you know about this young man that's up on the floor? He's got these bugs growing out of this wound, and I, you know they look pretty bad. And I brought his record up, brought up a couple of these. I'll tell you what they, what they mean in just a minute. And I said, Doug, stop. If he is OK, medically stable, I want you to go to his door and don't let anyone in or out. And what I'm talking about is this man had a wound, and he had cultures growing out. He looked at an infected surgical site. And these are just two of the, I think, five different bacteria that grew out. And I don't know if I have a pointer anywhere, but what I want to tell you is that one cell is called Pseudomonas aeruginosa. That's one bacteria, gram-negative rod. And the other one's called Escherichia coli, E. coli, which a lot of people have heard of. And that's one of those Enterobacteriaceae, the CREs that I just mentioned. The important thing here is each of these sort of tables, there's a list of antibiotics on the left side. So you can see amikacin, astrianum, and so forth, and the same thing over here. And then there's this second column, the interpretation. The R stands for resistant. So if we know it's sensitive to that drug, it's an S. If it's I, it's an intermediate, which a lot of people would interpret as resistant. R means resistant. So I'll just, I don't have to quiz you guys. These look like they're totally resistant organisms. So what do I do with a young man with a surgical site infection with bacteria that look like this? Very, very difficult. But there's more to it, and why, when I saw this, I asked them to uh, go over there and not let anyone in the room. So this is actually him. This is David Ricci. Uh, he and I were both on a PBS special last year, if anyone wants to look at it. It's a great special on the front line. David went to volunteer in Calcutta with AIDS orphans. Uh, and he was up in the morning with his colleagues, and he was walking along a train track. And for those of you who may have been there, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but Train tracks are big thoroughfares for people walking around. There tends to be lots of garbage in that in urban areas. And there's also a lot of sewage in the same area. So David was walking along and didn't hear anything, no horn or anything like that. And the train clipped his jacket, pulled him out, and cut off his right leg, mostly. So they, you know, he's down in this dirt and sewage and garbage and so forth. And they, his colleagues pick him up, they put him in the back of a, like a wagon that you can pull, bring him to the nearest uh, hospital. Uh, and for those of you who saw the show, you know what comes next. They said, you know, hold still, hold him down. They pull out a big saw and they cut off what's left. Over the next uh, week and a half, he is in and in, moves to different hospitals and he gets a number of different procedures. And then his parents fly over and bring him back to Harborview, where he comes to our trauma floor and where our surgeons take care of him and make sure he's okay. And he had a couple other small injuries, but the major one was a very high amputation of his right leg with a drain in it, with redness and erythema and lots of fluid pouring out. And that's where those cultures came from. Now, the couple of points here, 
This didn't happen in the United States, right? These drug use and bacteria, this is isolated when he first as he hit the doors in Seattle. These he got when he was in India. Now, I'm not blaming India. The United States has plenty of issues, but he brought those bacteria with him from another area, right? Which would imply that there's something going on where he was that was generating lots of drug resistance. And he brought them to us. Now, the United States has sent similar bacteria, drug resistant bacteria, to other countries. So it goes both ways. But our populations are moving everywhere. Where antibiotics are being used in one place has an impact globally. So not only when I treat you over here does it have an impact on you, but when I treat you people over here it has an impact on people across the globe. So how we use these antibiotics is very important. So the issue with David was that he had about four or five different things in there growing that were highly drug resistant. It took me six months to cure him, three more surgeries. He was neutropenic, which means he had no uh, pus cells left at one point. He had no white cells left at one point. I gave him renal failure at one point. I made him so sick that he couldn't eat and lost about 20 pounds. I put him into renal failure once, all because of the antibiotics we had to give him. And one of the biggest issues is that every time he went back to the OR, that little bit of leg he had left was getting shorter and shorter. And by the last time we got to it, we were actually thinking about whether he needed to disarticulate what was left of his femur. Now, when you think about function for a young man like David, right, that little bit of femur where you could put a prosthesis on and swing it forward was a big deal. So not only are we dealing with a terrible infection, but you're talking about how a young man functions for the rest of his life. And if you've ever seen that video, David, we were able to save that part. Um, and the drugs I put him on, I just kept going until he couldn't tolerate each one of them. And then we just crossed our fingers. Successfully, it's been about two years now and he's doing great. But it has a lot that has to do with how tough he is and how lucky we got. So, I told you we'd get to gonorrhea. Here's a 27-year-old man who comes to your clinic with symptoms consistent with urethritis. That's burning when you urinate. He's sexually active with men. He has oral and anal sex. Uh, he's pretty good about getting HIV tested. Uh, he got tested two months ago and it was negative. <clears throat> when he has sex, he doesn't wear protection. He's got burning when he urinates. So when I see a person like this, and you may think similarly, I think about a couple different infectious diseases. We talked about one, gonorrhea, right? And the other one would be chlamydia. So generally when we see folks like this, right, someone who's having unprotected sex in our community in this way is at high risk for sexually transmitted diseases. There's a lot of syphilis, chlamydia, and gonorrhea in uh, our population of men who have sex with men in Seattle. And so we think about folks like this, and someone who is taking these risks, and who's showing up in my clinic at Harborview, may not be someone who wants to come in a lot, right? Someone who's maybe not coming back in a couple days for follow-up appointment. Maybe just coming in because he's got burning when he urinates and he's worried he's got an STD. So this comes into play a little bit when we think about how we're gonna treat him. So first thing we do is we send off a urine nucleic acid amplification test for gonorrhea and chlamydia. And Dr. Cookson can tell you more about that if he wants, but I'll just tell you it's a really good test that saves you from getting a swab shoved up your urethra. <laughs> and so the thing though, I'm not gonna get that test back before he leaves the clinic. So I have a young man who's at risk for sexually transmitted disease. I wanna treat him right now. And fortunately for a long time, we've had a couple of oral medications, cefixime and azithromycin, that I can treat both chlamydia and gonorrhea one time, right now, one big you know, mouthful and you're done. And you can walk out of the clinic and I can be pretty sure that you're cured and you won't be transmitting to someone else. So that's been a real great benefit, right? The problem, though, is multifold. So one, I want to let tell you to know that gonorrhea is an important pathogen. People may think it's just this STD that causes burning when you urinate, but it's the number one, number, excuse me, the number two most common reported infectious disease in the United States. Now, we don't report all infectious diseases, but of the ones that are reported, it's the number two. And it's at least probably 600,000 cases a year probably underreported. And this is really important. In men, it causes urethritis. In women, it causes pelvic, pelvic inflammatory disease and organ damage and infertility. So you think globally, this is a really important pathogen for, particularly for women, because they may be completely asymptomatic and develop bad outcomes as a result. This is a great article by Jerome Grootman called Sex and the Superbug. The superbug in this one isn't E. coli, it isn't MRSA, this is gonorrhea. I'm telling you right now, gonorrhea is a superbug. 
And here's just to kind of outline that a little bit. And sorry that gray didn't show up, but that he says sulfonamides back in 1936 introduced. About 10 years, sulfonamide resistance was detected in gonorrhea widespread. Again, in gray up there, it says 40, 1945 penicillin. 1940s tetracycline were being used for gonorrhea. And down here at the bottom, which you can't read, obviously, because it's in brown. I don't know why. But 1945s, 1970s, uh, you start seeing uh, genes associated with penicillin and tetracycline resistance with increasing levels of resistance over those years. So each time an antibiotic's introduced and used for gonorrhea, drug resistance comes down the track about five to 10 years later. Here we have penicillinase producing gonorrhea. So that means that the penicillinase is an enzyme that kills off penicillin uh, in the United States. So global, and then getting right down to where we're living, tetracycline resistance. So again, we're starting to lose the ability to use these drugs. 1989, ceftraxone is recommended. Penicillin is dropped because of this increase in resistance in penicillinase. 1993, quinolones, like levofloxacin, right, a commonly used antibiotic for respiratory tract infections and other infections like that, are recommended. And then cefixime in many places. It's nice oral medication. Remember, one dose, all done. You don't have to even worry about leaving the clinic. But you see down here, before we even recommend starting using fluoroquinolones in Hawaii, we have fluoroquinolone resistant uh, gonorrhea. And what happens here is a very predictable pattern. Basically, the, the ring of fire, that's basically the ring of urethritis. So if you go around the Pacific Rim, over on the west side there, you start seeing drug resistant gonorrhea develop kind of in Japan and Southeast Asia, and it kind of tracks down or crafts over Hawaii, and then up the California coast and right to Seattle. So we're one of the early places to see drug resistance. So this quinolone resistant Hawaii basically says we're, it's coming towards us. And we already are using quinolones here. So quinolones no longer recommend in 2007. And the problem here is that in 2011, we start seeing cefixime resistance. After cefixime, we lost cefixime uh, just epidemiologically. You know, we know that not all gonorrhea is resistant. But remember, I have this young man right in front of me who may not come back tomorrow, who may be able to spread this bacteria around. I need to treat him right now. And if I don't have, if I don't know for sure what the drug resistance patterns are, I want to use the best drug I can use possible. And so when we lost cefixime, when I'm worried about cefixime resistance, I ran out of oral antibiotics for treating gonorrhea. That's a big deal when you think about the operational aspects of that. Now what do I do? And so what we do now is we give people a shot of ceftriaxone. So we give them azithromycin orally that treats the chlamydia, and we give them ceftriaxone. The azithromycin, fortunately, double covers that. So we help prevent drug resistance by giving both those drugs at the same time. A lot of people don't like to get shots, though. I've seen lots of sick people like, I just don't know, I don't, I don't want a shot, right? And here's the thing, ceftriaxone-resistant gonorrhea has been discovered. There are cases of ceftriaxone-resistant gonorrhea in Japan right now. And we know that they track across the Pacific, up the coast, and to us. And here's the problem. What am I gonna do when I have that young man in my clinic who I need to treat right now, and all I have is an intravenous drug? That means putting a, you know, a line in and treating him with some whatever drug, or having to say, you need to take this medication for the next seven days. I won't tell you how old I am, but when I was that age, I couldn't have taken any medication for more than a day. You know, it's hard to take pills. And if you're young and running around and stuff like that, it's even harder, right? So you can see why this is so important. And this is a result of drug antibiotic use and, to a certain extent, misuse. So here's the thing. This is a battle that we are going to lose if we don't pay very close attention. Bacteria and fungi are the places where we've gotten most of these, bacteria, most of these antibiotics originated. There's a few classes like fluoroquinolones, which we, made, we synthesized on our own. But remember, Flory and Fleming isolated penicillin, penicillin, penicillin from penicillium, fungi. All these chemicals that we sort of built our antibiotic uh, antibiotics on are originated in nature. And the drug resistance mechanisms have already been there. Bacteria and fungi have been fighting each other for a billion years or more. And when we come in here and use antibiotics, we're just muddling around in a battle that they've been fighting that whole time. So this is a really cool study that came out a couple years ago. So you know those ice cores people do for climate studies? So this team went to the uh, Yukon outside of Dawson City, down there in the bottom, and they sort of took an area, they put a plate down, they sterilized it with alcohol, and then they took a big soil core 
and then they pulled the soil core up, made sure they were all sterile and super, things like that. And they went back and they obviously sampled lots of samples here, but they went down to this Dawson tephra, which is about 30,000 years ago. And you can see we're talking about, you know, mammoths and bison and giant birds and all kinds of craziness. And they went and looked at the DNA that they could find, the remnants of DNA. And what they were able to find were genes. There was one gene they found called Van A. Van A is the gene that's in a drug-resistant bacteria now called vancomycin-resistant enterococci. So 30,000 years ago, when we weren't using the antibiotics, the bacteria already had genes that generated resistance to the drugs that we're using today. Because the drugs we use today are based on the chemicals that these bacteria and fungi have been using against each other for billions of years. So when we use an antibiotic, it is inevitable that drug resistance will arise. And what we need to work on is trying to stretch that timeline out as far as we possibly can by using drugs rationally, rather than irrationally as we're doing right now. So where are we in the United States in terms of rational drug use? This is the best data we have. So here's looking at developed countries, with France at the top, Netherlands at the bottom. And this is just a way to sort of standardize uh, antibiotic use. It's the defined daily dose. It's not really important what it exactly means, but the more, the longer the bar, that means the more antibiotic you use per 1,000 people uh, per day. France is the highest among the developed countries, but we're number five. And so one thing is where we are in general. Number two is there's variation. Why is there variation in antibiotic use? Are, people, are, there, are there fewer people who have infectious diseases in the Netherlands than there are in Australia? I don't think that's quite the case. This, here's looking at the United States specifically. Now, the lighter colors mean less antibiotic use. The darker colors mean more antibiotic use. So the highest, for instance, in these southeastern states is 1,214 antibiotic prescriptions per 1,000 people per year. That means that everybody, on average, gets more than one antibiotic per year. Now, obviously, was, there's people in that who are getting multiple antibiotics, and some who are getting none. But that means more than everyone's getting an antibiotic at some point. And then you look up in Washington, the West Coast there, in Alaska, the lowest, 533 prescriptions per 1,000 people. You'd be like, oh, that's great. We're not West Virginia, right? <laughs> that means that one out of every two people gets an antibiotic prescription. That doesn't, I mean, that's better. Is that good? I don't think so. And again, the point being that there's wide variation. There's not more infections in these states than there are in California you know, per 1,000 people. It just doesn't make sense. <clears throat> so, you know, what do we know about why this is important or not important in terms of drug use? So this is just one graph among many bits of data. I'll explain to you a little bit. So this is looking at antibiotic use by country level. And on the bottom axis here, basically says how much antibiotic, how much penicillin you, is used in 2010, just as a country. Like how many tons of penicillin do we use? And on the other axis going up and down is how much non-susceptible or resistant strep pneumo is. So streptococcus pneumonia is a, the most common cause of pneumonia. It can cause ear infections and it can cause nas you know, sinus infections and other things. Very, very common bacteria. And there's a, you can take a look here. So the countries that use more antibiotic, more penicillin, have more penicillin resistant strep pneumo. So France uses the most. I just showed you that graphic before. They use a lot of antibiotics. They use tons of penicillin. And they have proportionally the highest amount of drug resistant or penicillin resistant strep pneumonia in the, in, among these developed countries. And down at the bottom, I showed you the Netherlands use the least. They also have the least amount of drug resistant strep pneumo in the same place. So again, wide variation that appears to be correlated. Now, this is just an association. It doesn't tell you this is what's causing it, but it's a strong association. And the United States is right up there by Spain. You can't see it here, but in other data that's exactly the same, it's, we fall right up there on that end. So one of the things, though, we have to recognize and acknowledge is antibiotic use around the world. Most children who die of pneumonia around the world don't die because they got the wrong antibiotic. Or they, didn't, they don't die because of drug resistance. They die because they didn't get an antibiotic. Right? Most children under five who die of pneumonia die because they did not get an antibiotic. So we have to balance access, just access, right? Treating people who need antibiotics with excess. I told you 50% of the antibiotics used in the United States are probably incorrect or inappropriate. And I could talk about this for hours and hours and hours. But much of the world doesn't get the antibiotics they need. Right? So that access versus excess needs to be balanced carefully. 
And what we want is people to have more access to health care. That is just, right? This is antibiotic use in India, 2005-2009. Uh, and what we see is increasing amounts of antibiotic use in many different classes, not all. And in many ways, we know that India is a developing economy. More people are getting access to care, right? More people are participating in the economy and, and education and all those things, what we want countries to do. But part of that is antibiotic use is growing. And what I start, the first case I told you about was David Ricci, who was injured in a hospital, or hos injured and then taken care of in a hospital in India. And he probably got that bacteria either in that ditch on the side of the road or in the hospital he was in, because in these in the countries like India, you, didn't, you need no prescription to get your antibiotic. You can just go to this store and say, I have this, or I'm worried about that, and you just get an antibiotic. It may not be the right drug, it may not be the right dose, it may not be for the right length of time. And we already know from Sir Alexander Fleming's 1945 Nobel Prize speech that that's exactly what he was worried about, is what's happening in much of the world. Most of the world, you can do this. And what happens is you take these antibiotics, they may work, they may not, they may be insufficient, you develop drug resistance in your body, you spread those bacteria around, they get into the water supply, and other people get infections. One other important part of this, and I'm getting close to my, the end of my part here, is that about 30 million tons of antibiotics are generated in the United States per year. 30 million tons. Who gets most of them? Animals. 80% of that 30 million tons goes into animals. And it is for two reasons, right? I eat meat, so I'm not exempt from this. We, since 1900, as a society, have increased our meat intake, our demand as consumers for meat. And farmers have answered that by you know, pushing more and more animals into small areas and uh, getting them out, you know, ripen them faster, whatever. And part of that is that a lot of them live in unhygienic conditions. Vets who are taking care of them want to make sure they stay healthy, they get wounds, they're not eating the right foods, they get diarrhea, blah, blah, blah. So they want to treat those conditions. That many cows, chickens, and pigs out in the United States means a lot of antibiotics to treat infectious diseases, or at least animals at risk. But the second thing is that back in the 19, late 1940s, 1950s, people found out that if you give animals small amounts of antibiotic, they grow faster. They get fatter faster. They put on muscle faster, which means you can, as soon as that calf is born, you start feeding antibiotics, it gets to market faster, and it feeds every, what, everyone, what everyone wants. You give them to these orally, some of them, they probably have an effect on the microbiota, the micro, the, all the bacteria in their guts. It has some effect on how they grow. No one's 100% sure why. A lot of them get come out in the stool. And if any of you have been near a big, uh, you know, congregate animal factory, these CAFOs, they have big pools of sewage which are probably teeming with antibiotics and bacteria. There's an Enterobacteriaceae I talked about, E. coli and so forth. And remember, it, you don't have to give them, you're not giving them treatment doses, you're giving them subclinical doses to get them fatter faster. And we publicize this, you know, this is still a big deal. And let me tell you, you know, big time commercial farming groups, they want to keep this pipeline going. And so there's been activity on trying to get them to use antibiotics that we don't use in humans, and ones that you know not related, but it's, it's a challenging situation because a lot of people want you know, the direct link. If I give antibiotics, this is what happens. But I also let you know that we do it to the animals too. So there's been studies out of Iowa that show that MRSA in human populations get into the pig populations. And so we're doing it to each other back and forth. But this issue definitely needs to be addressed. When most antibiotics in the United States are being used in animals, we can't say that we're gonna fix our problem among our, our use in humans if we don't deal with how we're de treating our animals as well. And here's the last part. So we can sit here and say, and we've de say this last 50 years, well, as soon as we have a problem with a drug resistant bacteria, we'll get another antibiotic. We'll just keep on churning them out. And what this basically shows in these little uh, four or five year intervals along the bottom, it says the number of antibacterial drug, new drug applications for the FDA have put out. So if you said, oh, don't worry about drug resistance, we'll just get new antibiotics back in 1980, you'd say, yeah, no, we got 20 new antibiotics cooking. We're looking good. Or maybe 85 was okay, but if you look forward to 2010, 2012, there's maybe one or two antimicrobials out there. So I can't look at the antibiotic pipeline and say, I'm not worried about drug resistance, we'll just get a new antibiotic. Because the drug companies don't want to do this. Because as soon as they put that drug out in the population, 
right? People like me are going to say, let's be careful with that. And, or we're going to use it for very short periods of time. If you're a drug company, you want to make money. How do you make money? What kind of drug do you want to sell? So you want to take it, sell a drug that people are going to take for the rest of their life, right? Erectile dysfunction and restless legs, but also things, important things like depression and hypertension, you know, drugs and cholesterol medicines. Those are where you're going to have people taking pills for the rest of your life. And as a pharmaceutical company, CEO, your job is to make money for your shareholders. Antibiotics, that's a tough place to go because I'm going to give you a drug that you're going to take for a week or for two weeks, right? And how am I going to really recoup that? So it's a challenging thing that we need to engage our government and all these pharmaceutical companies in order to somehow find a way to make it attractive to reverse this trend. Because right now, when I saw that kid, that, when I saw David, and I saw all that stuff, there's no drug, some experimental drug, I can call up the company and say, can I please have that drug so I can try it on David? It just doesn't exist. So when you think about what we use antibiotics for, getting your teeth pulled, right? An abscess or something like that. Skin infection. You get in a car accident and snap your femur and it pops out of your skin. Back in World War I, the mortality rate from an open fracture was 80 to 90 percent. What changed that was antibiotic use. When you get an operation, even an elective surgery, you get your hip replaced, you may not know it, but you get a dose of antibiotic to prevent surgical site infections, right? Think about a world where you could not do surgery, where you could not repair traumas, where you couldn't get your teeth fixed. Just think about that, because that's the direction we're headed unless we get a hold of this problem. Because nothing's, there's no, you know, white knight in shining armor, or knight in a shining white horse, whatever it is, is coming to save us, right? We have to save ourselves. We can't rely upon the companies. This is a quote from Joshua Lederberg, a Nobel Prize winner who's, you know, active in antimicrobials and microbiology for decades. Uh, Pitted against microbial genes, we have mainly our wits. We have to use our wits because we're entering into this battle where the genes have been fighting and working for billions of years. And we have to find a way to use antibiotics wisely. We have to find a way to treat infectious diseases and diagnose them intelligently. Thank you for your attention.